what Mr. Lasan was also pointing out to the fact was when he, he needed a tool to understand how to evaluate where he's going to make money in the mineral industry. And obviously it's from here to here on this part of the curve, and then also from here to here. Cartes A has another up period, and that's where you should be looking at. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another presentation on the Online Investment Conference. My name is Peter Norman. I'm the founder of the Online Investment Conference. Our goal at the OIC is to provide you, the investor, with investment ideas worth watching. And today's investment idea is Karshiv Resources, listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol ECR. Our presenter is Philippe Cloutier, President and CEO of Karshiv. Philippe, welcome once again. Hello there, Peter. Philippe, it's December the 14th and 2022 is almost over. It's a good time for a review and a wrap up of the past year, and perhaps a brief outline of plans for 2023. Before we get to that review, though, let's talk about something that's gained currency over the past year. As Karshay acquired the huge East Cadillac property from O3 Mining and has begun to exploit the potential of the property. That's the question of where does an acquisition of this size place Karshay in terms of its position on the Lassonde curve, the well-known theory used to qualify and quantify junior mining explorers. Does the Lausanne curve still apply in today's markets? Yes and no. Yes, for the general concept that what it was developed for. And a bit on the no side because markets are entirely different and the spectators are entirely different to when Pierre Lausanne developed this concept. One of the reasons we're, we're going to start off with this is since we believe that the Chaimo mine is on the path to production process, then it's apropos to map it with respect to the Lasson curve that originally wanted to map how a junior exploration company went from a concept to discovery to delineating a deposit and, and, and finally brought it into production. Markets and times have changed and a lot of juniors don't do that anymore. They, when they, they, the project that they, the, that they discover and delineate actually gets bought out. But in the case of Chimo, I'll walk you through the history of the project and where at different times where it was situated. Let me just underline a few points here. So the Chimo mine project is a past producing gold mine. So by definition, when it ceased production in 1997, right, the price of gold was 360 US dollars. And, and so because of that, then the project would be situated there. But from 1997 to today, there has been over 25 years of mining innovation and metallurgy innovations, right? And so we acquired the project in 2013. And so by that argument, well, the project would have would be situated there in, in 2013. And it took us about two or three years to dust off all the old underground maps and stuff and review the reports and uh you know how and and discover how this thing had been brought to production from early discovery in the 40s and then and then and, and then the first production in the 60s by chimo gold mines incorporated and then a uh, uh, um, a uh, questions period and then brought back into production in 1980s by Louvem and then bought out by cambior which was the company that shut it down in 1997. it took us four years to review that and really you know align our exploration program and by then, obviously, uh, we had attracted uh, Agnico Eagle as a, a senior sponsor to the program. So, so then the project, we would have positioned it over here, just between pre-discovery and discovery, because we knew that the project had mineral endowment, uh, and, but we had, to, we had to prove that there was more gold there. Um, drilled 60,000 meters of diamond drilling, uh, produced three resource estimates, about $14 million worth of exploration investment uh, to give us a combined resource of indicated inferred just under 2 million ounces. There was 1.3 inferred and a, and a 0.7 of, of indicated gold ounces. And then we, we kind of understood that we were kind of landlocked. We, we knew we could continue to grow the project east and west in a depth. And that's when we, uh, we expanded the project by consolidating ground with the O3 mining and they became a significant shareholder in exchange of 100% of their project. At that point, we were over here and we produced yet a fourth resource estimate. But at the same time, we, you know, we took the brakes off of the PA that we had launched somewhere in here. 
where are we today? We've brought the project to resource estimate level. And now I would say the speculators have left the story and, and they know that what's coming theoretically is expensive uh, exploration to get you to a production decision. So I, I would say we're, we're, we're here. If I had to map it with respect to the, the Lasson curve concept or approach, those are the historical points. So we are here, and that would, you know, that would tend to say that we are undervalued with respect to the value that we've actually built into the company. It also begs to the fact that we're turning over the demographics of our shareholders. Now, an, uh, an entirely different group of shareholders would be attracted to a project that has been de-risked, and, and we've taken the, the, the sort of a, the dream factor out of the project from a speculator's uh, approach. You have to keep in mind, though, that this thing was built in the 90s, pre-internet. With the internet, there's, you know, it's like speculation on steroids. And so there's, there's been a lot of uh, stuff that's been going on. But I would say the concept still applies, especially to map out where uh, a junior is. Once it's locked into a discovery, then you know it has to delineate the deposit. If it has a deposit that's economic, then you know taking it from a preliminary economic assessment to a full feasibility and a production decision, well, that's going to take a lot of money. So that's not for your speculator. And that's for the institutions. But then the speculator can come back in and, and, and make money. I think what Mr. Lasson was also pointing out to the fact was well, he, he needed a tool to understand how to evaluate where he's going to make money in the mineral industry. And obviously it's from here to here on this part of the curve, and then also from here to here. Cards say has another up period, and that's where you should be looking at. You'll see in the next few slides, which is a kind of a wrap up of what we've done in 2022, and, and you could come back to this uh, to this slide later. So there you have it. I mean, in essence, what we've done in 2022, we consolidated uh, the land package around the Chimo mine. This was the former uh, Chimo mine uh, property here in, in dark green. That was ours, and then by acquiring 100% control of the O3 mining ground, well, we now uh, own this extremely large land position, which is basically a uh, control of 40 kilometers of the Larder Lake uh, Cadillac Fault. Because of the consolidation of both assets, well, there was a 43101 on the West Nordo deposit here. There were three, four, uh, well, one current 43101 on the Chimo Mine Project, and regulations stipulate that we had to consolidate both of that. So we came up with a fourth resource estimate, chalking in uh, 720,000 uh, ounces in the indicated category and 1.633 uh, million ounces in the inferred category. Uh, keep in mind that prior to consolidation, we had uh, produced three uh, public, some public and internal engineering studies namely the shaft haulage capacity uh, that can be found on our website and the ore sorting uh, pre-concentration material um, study, which is also found on our, uh, on our website. And the stope design and sequencing, well, that was on part of the ongoing PEA work. And so note here that, you know, a lot of people tend to forget that there's 25 million tons of material at Chimo that grades on average three grams per ton. Um, and, and, and when that hits that surface, uh, that thing being ore sorted will probably be in, in the range of five to six grams per ton. And so that's being looked at and, and the benefits of that are being looked at in the PA that we're working on. The transaction was one thing, vetting of the transaction by uh, again, participation of Agnico to, to raise its interest in Cartse. That's the second thing we got done. Once it got done, obviously, I just mentioned we did the resource estimate, then we designed the drill program to continue growing uh, Chimo. So that's it. This is a slide taken from our last press release that shows you the drill program uh, that, that, that was designed, 25,000 meters of diamond drilling with two drill rigs. It's currently, um, it's currently in, in progress. Uh, one note here, the drills will take a Christmas break from December 19th to January 5th. So the drillers will be off and, and come back rested, fully rested by uh, January 5th. But you can see on this slide uh, where all the drilling that was planned, uh, you know, um, for the, the, the program is. Uh, the, black, the black circles are the ones completed. 
the green circles are the ones to be done, and the orange uh, circles are where the jewel uh, rigs are currently positioned. Um, and so the, the, the objective of the, the programs obviously is to grow the resource is around the East Chimo mine sector and to grow them around the Nordo West sector as well. And then also to come in and test and grow the resources under a, a this potential new uh, slice here and continue to grow it uh, beneath the zones that are well known just west of the Chimo mine shaft. Um, for those who are interested, well, the former property boundaries between Chimo and O3 mining are here and over here. So you obviously understand the, the value of the transaction is that we benefit by being able to continue expand the Chimo mine gold system and uh, laterally and at depth because obviously the property boundary to the north this thing would eventually plunge onto um, their ground as well. And, and we're currently working on the PEA and the jewels will continue after Christmas uh, towards May. What have we done since, you know, acquiring the project and, you know, just before that first lift in the, in the Lausanne curve, there was, when we picked it up, we had to assume that there were no other ounces. Uh, we begged to differ and, and we got to drilling. We produced our first resource estimate in 2019. And the markets were what they were. The M&A crowd, the, the, the potential suitors for this were of one mindset. It's been uh, f f four to five years now. We continue drilling and continue doing the project and continue drilling, continue to grow the project. Then we transacted with O3. And by sheer transaction, we continue to grow the project. Uh, the drill program that we're doing right now same objective, continue to grow, continue to be relevant, and to continue to you know, push for this project towards a production decision. The final slide here, what are we looking forward in 2023? Right off the bat, we should have um, uh, drill results, um, which would eventually, once the program is done, uh, you know, upgrade uh, the resource estimate. Uh, we're gonna pursue the engineering studies that uh, we're close to uh, the final approaches for the PA. I would suspect, you know, latest January, early February for a release. And so we're starting off the year with news flow from Jewel, uh, Jewel uh, results, engineering studies, and drilling will continue. And uh, we're just hoping the markets will be uh, more receptive to our story in 2023. So that's it. That's what we've done in 2022, Peter. That's what we're looking forward to 2023. And you know, in answer to uh, some people's uh, questioning about, you know, where are you on this famous and time-tested Lassonde curve, I would answer what I answered earlier on. Philippe, super presentation as always. And now let's take a few questions. And I do want to get back to that uh, post that we saw just this morning on CEO.ca. And if this was Jeff who said, the 30-year-old Lassonde curve has outlived its practical usage and wisdom. Probably the modern day internet has done it in. I understand what the what the gentleman was getting at, and he's quite right in saying that the time at which Mr. Lasson generated this curve and the tools he had at his disposal are, 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 are totally different now. And yes, uh, internet and and social media will take news and uh, will you know will apply steroids to it and whatever. But the concept here and and. Mr. Lassonde is an astute investor, and you could bet that, yeah, he was only looking at trying to pick out the winners, uh, and he didn't want to uh, waste his time with the losers. I could only speculate on how he generated this. At the time, you're looking at the, you know, the 90s or before that, he probably looked at about 40 different successful juniors and said, okay, let's map what happened from concept to discovery to delineation, to feasibility, to development. And he said, oh, you know, and, and after a while, after looking at 40 or whatever number of these companies, it soon dawned on them, well, you know, if there's two bumps to this thing and I want to buy at the bottom of one bump and sell at the top of one and buy at the bottom of another. And so I, I'm only speculating on how he generated this. And then he had a tool to continue, you know, identifying the winners 
and tracking uh, the best in the pack. For the industry, other investors come along and speculators come along and, and they want to position you on the Lasan curve. And, and as a practitioner, we don't usually put this in our presentations. But to answer some questions when people say, well, where are you with, they, they need a map, they need a tool to reference where they are if they have to make an investment decision. So I, I understand where the gentleman's coming from, and I agree, and I could, if you go to Lichtenav's discovery.com website, the, this individual does, I think he does on, with computer power, what Mr. Lasson was doing way back then. He's actually got a case history of uh, Guyana Goldfields. Over a 15 year period, you can see boom, boom, boom. You can see many, many bumps. It points to what Jeff was saying, you know, that this was from 2000 and for, yeah, from 2000 to 2018. Eventually Guyana Goldfields got bought out after even putting this deposit into production. That's an example where there are adaptations and modifications to the Lassonde curve. And again, it's, um, it's, it's just a tool and we're answering a question. Hey, Phil, if you had to plot Chimo along the Lasan curve, where would it be? Uh, and I gave you an answer that in the lifetime of Chimo, then and now, uh, we could position in, uh, we could position the, the project uh, along several points here. How's the ongoing drill program progressing? It's fun. Two machines, we're on track, on schedule. Obviously we had, we started with the, with, with the deeper holes, right? Uh, down in here and, and, and down in here. And then we worked ourselves up. And so now we're into the drilling the shallower bits. So uh, now we're turning around holes uh, a lot quicker. And we put out our first press release on the East Chimo mine area. So we're, we, the, the, uh, we're seeing that the grades are there and we're, we're going to be able to expand the resources here. Uh, but in fact, what you're looking at and that in that release there is zone three. So the zone is actually behind the section by tens of meters, and we're and, and so therefore that the the what is now called zone three is going to start contributing, as well as the zone that's on the long section. Uh, that's for one of the drills. The second drill is is currently over here after having you know drilled off this part where we wanted to create more ounces. And one of the results that we have in hand is a nine or 9.6 grammar, and that's included in the five meter section. We're always looking to map uh, wide sections because that's how we're engineering the program, vault mining underground. That second drill after having finished this pod is onto this one. This is looking good as well. So it, it completed this one, it, it, it's now on this and it's going to be drilling this area right here. And just after Christmas, or in January, it's gonna come in and do this part right here. Whereas this machine is gonna move up, do this part, and then move here. And that's good because uh, the ground conditions uh, behind here and here needed some ice packing because it's swampy ground. So we're, we're actually moved away from the deep drilling and that sort of coincides with, you know, kind of funny, but in the last few weeks, the, the labs are, you know, they're freeing up. We weren't getting this because we started our program late August, but we kept hearing stories that the labs were jammed up, but that's no longer the case. So to answer your question, the drill program is on budget, on schedule, two machines, 24 seven. We are taking a break starting next week, December 19th to January 5th. Uh, the drillers will be rested up and they'll be back. And so will our geological team to uh, continue the program onwards till, you know, April, May. And while the drilling continues, obviously there's another group of professionals, uh, engineers and, and geologists, of uh, a consulting firm that are working to complete our PEA. And that should be, uh, you know, late January, early February, something like that. So that's what's happening on the drill program. What are your expectations? My expectations are relatively high because as you can see, we're not prospecting with a drill or wildcat drilling. We're, we're sticking close to the zones that where we know, you know, there's a high probability of, of intersection. And not only that, but we're also designing and drilling holes that will further add ounces and produce yet another uh, updated mineral resource estimate. So my expectations are high and the first results that we've seen come in are good. We're hoping to put out another drill hole results uh, early January uh, when everybody comes back from, from vacation, if we can get these in and, and, and process. So my expectations are high.
When do you expect the PEA to be published? I'm hoping late January uh, at the at the latest, maybe early February. Based on the work advancement that, that I'm seeing, um, that's what I would expect. You know, I'm not expecting, you know, knock on wood, I'm not expecting uh, material delays. What do you do after the PEA? Yeah, that's fun because uh, we know the drill program will continue. We suspect the results of that will be an upgraded uh, resource estimate, which will then naturally tweak and, and, and the PA itself will be outdated by then. Uh, as we already know that the, the most recent resource estimate is still dated as well. Uh, but there's, a, there's an interesting chapter in, in PAs, I guess it's the recommendations part, that maps uh, the road to, you know, pre-feasibility and feasibility. And, and that's interesting because it takes us out of our comfort zone, but it generally is an indication that your project, what you have to keep doing to, to get your project to that production decision, uh, or in other words, keep de-risking the, the, the project. You know, and that's, and that's one thing I alluded to uh, in, 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 in the, let's call them the Lassonde days. I don't want to, he's still alive and well. So in the Lausanne days, um, companies would, they'd see these juniors make a discovery and sometimes they would, you know, they'd buy them out, they'd buy ounces. I think senior companies today, what we've seen in the most recent M&As is they're buying revenue and cash flow. And so their message to junior explorers and or even junior producers is, hey, we, we, we not, we're, we're not only buying ounces today, but we're buying de-risk ounces. We want zero risk. And if you could even start, you know, developing the projects yourself, well, so be it. You know, well, we don't we don't mind paying extra. We just don't want to pay for risk. What's Carche doing in 2023 to spread the Carche story? Nested in my my earlier responses is, you know, 2022 was a lot of work, especially because we're a very small team. Uh, but now that the drill program is underway, the PA is la launched and almost finished it frees up a lot of my time. So I'm going to hit the ground marketing, uh, especially hoping that we're, we're definitely out of lockdown now. And we're going to bring the story uh, and market it and, and bring our story and, and make people aware, our retail, institutional and corporates alike, even more aware than we've done in the past. Uh, and it's, it's a fun situation to be because we've got $7 million in cash. We're drilling. We've got two drills to back up and continue feeding news flow. We're going to have a document which basically gives you a Polaroid or a value uh, of, of the, the mining asset. So that's what we're going to be doing in 2023. I'm going to be doing 2023 while you know our, our team continues to advance this project. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our live Q&A. If you haven't submitted a question yet or want to submit one later, you can always do so by emailing philippe.cloutier at resourcescarche.com. That's philippe.cloutier at resourcescarche.com. Or you can give them a call at 819-874-1331. As you can tell, he just loves talking to investors. And now before we close out the presentation, I'm going to turn things over to Phil for one last time. Phil, as we always do, why don't we talk about three things that investors should remember about Carshape Resources? Through the last three to five years, we've continually advanced this project. And 2022 was all about making sure that we could get it across the finish line by consolidating with a huge land position. Fortunately or unfortunately, that coincided with a not very good market year for the minerals industry as a whole. But they should remember that we continue to build value at the Chimo Mine project. We have diamond drilling in progress that continues to grow the project's value and that we're also going to be delivering a PEA. We're also looking out to the new opportunities in 2023 to, to reward our shareholders. We hope there'll be new shareholders along to, to buy into the story as well. Well, thank you, Philippe. And before we go, a reminder that today's presentation was from Karshi Resources, trading on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the ticker symbol ECR. Our presenter was Philippe Cloutier, President and CEO of Karshi. The drilling program on the Chimal Mine project is well underway. There's money in the bank and a well thought out plan for putting it to work. There's lots more news in the hopper, and we'll be back early in the new year with another update.
You can learn about upcoming presentations at onlineinvestmentconference.com or by following us on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm Peter Norman, founder of the Online Investment Conference. Stay safe, be well, and until we meet again, au revoir.